Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, the Brahmin son. In the shade of the house, in the sunshine near the boats on the river bank, in the shade of the sal forest, in the shade of the fig tree, Siddhartha grew up. The beautiful son of the Brahmin, the young falcon, together with Govinda, his friend, the son of the Brahmin. Sun tanned Siddhartha's light shoulders on the river bank when he bathed, when he performed his holy ablutions, his holy offerings. Shade flowed into his black eyes in the mango grove, during boyhood games, during his mother's singing, during the holy offerings, during the teachings of his father, the scholar, during the conversations of the sages. Siddhartha had long been taking part in the conversation of the sages, practicing the verbal battle with Govinda, practicing the art of contemplation with Govinda, the service of meditation. He already knew how to soundlessly speak the Om, the word of words, soundlessly speak it into himself, breathing it in, soundlessly speak it out of himself, breathing it out with all his soul, his forehead enveloped in the luster of his clear thinking mind. He already understood how to know Atman in his innermost being, indestructible, at one with the universe. Joy leaped in his father's heart about the sun, the intelligent boy thirsty for knowledge, and he saw him growing up to be a great sage and priest, a prince among the Brahmins. Bliss leaped in his mother's breast, when she saw him, when she saw him striding, saw him sitting down and standing up. Siddhartha, the strong, the beautiful boy, striding on slender legs, greeting her with perfect breeding. Love stirred in the hearts of the young Brahmin daughters when Siddhartha passed through the streets of the town with his radiant brow, with his royal eyes, with his narrow hips. But more than anyone else, Govinda loved him, his friend, the Brahmin's son. He loved Siddhartha's eyes and lovely voice. He loved the way he walked and the perfect breeding of his movements. He loved everything that Siddhartha said and did. And most of all, he loved his mind, his lofty, fiery thoughts, his glowing will, his high calling. Govinda knew that Siddhartha would become no ordinary Brahmin, no lazy sacrificial official, no grasping peddler of spells, no vain and empty orator, no evil deceitful priest, and no good stupid sheep in the herd of the many, no. Nor did he, Govinda, wish to become any of those, a Brahmin like the other ten thousand. He wanted to follow Siddhartha, the splendid beloved. And some day, when Siddhartha became a god, some day, when he joined the radiant ones, then Govinda would follow him as his friend, as his companion, as his servant, as his lance bearer, his shadow. They all loved Siddhartha. He brought joy to all. He delighted them all. But Siddhartha did not bring joy to himself. He did not delight himself. Walking along the rosy paths of the fig orchard, sitting in the bluish shade of the grove of contemplation, washing his limbs in the daily bath of atonement, sacrificing in the densely shaded mango forest with perfect breeding of his gestures, loved by all, a joy to all, he nevertheless bore no joy in his heart. Dreams came to him, and fretful thoughts flowing from the water of the river, twinkling from the stars of the night, from the sun's melting rays. Dreams came to him, and restlessness of his soul smoked from the offerings, breathed from the verses of the Rig Veda, dripped from the teachings of the old Brahmins. Siddhartha had started nursing discontent within himself, he had started feeling that his father's love and his mother's love and also his friend Govinda's love would not make him happy forever and always not please him, gratify him, satisfy him. 
he had begun to sense that his venerable father and his other teachers, that the wise Brahmins had already imparted to him the bulk and the best of their knowledge, that they had already poured their fullness into his waiting vessel, and the vessel was not full. His mind was not contented, his soul was not tranquil, his heart not sated. The ablutions were good, but they were water. They did not wash away sin, they did not slake the thirst of the mind, they did not calm the fright of the heart. Splendid were the offerings and the invokings of the gods, but was that all there was? Did the offerings bring happiness? And what about the gods? Was it really Prajapati who had created the world? Was it not Atman, he, the only one, the all one? Were not the gods' formations created like me and you, subject to time, ephemeral? So was it good? Was it right? Was it sublime and meaningful act to sacrifice to the gods? To whom else should one sacrifice? To whom else was veneration due but to him, the only one, Atman? And where was Atman to be found? Where did he dwell? Where did his eternal heart beat, if not in one's own self? In the innermost, in the indestructible essence that every person bore within. But where? Where was this self, this innermost self, this ultimate? It was not flesh and blood. It was not thinking or consciousness. That was what the wisest teach. But then where? Where was it? To pierce there to the self, to myself, to Atman. Was there any other path worth seeking? Ah, but no one showed this path. No one knew it, not his father, not the teachers and sages, not the holy, sacrificial chants. They knew everything. The Brahmins and their holy books, they knew everything. They had concerned themselves with everything, and with more than everything. The creation of the world, the genesis of speech, of food, of inhaling, of exhaling, the orders of the senses, the deeds of the gods, they knew an infinite amount. But was it worthwhile knowing all this if you did not know the one and only, the most important the only important thing. True, many verses in the holy books, especially in the Upanishads of Samavida, spoke about this innermost and ultimate glorious verses. Thy soul is the entire world, they said. And it was written that in sleep, in deep sleep, a human being goes into his innermost and dwells in Atman. Wonderful wisdom was in these verses, all the wisdom of the wisest was gathered here in magical words, as pure as honey gathered by bees. No, there was no disdaining the tremendous amount of knowledge collected and preserved here by countless generations of wise Brahmins. But where were the Brahmins? Where the priests, where the sages or penitents who had succeeded in not only knowing this deepest knowledge, but also living it? Where was the initiate who spirited his home in Atman from sleeping to waking to living at every step and turn in word and deed? Siddhartha knew many venerable Brahman. Above all, his father, the pure, the learned, the supremely venerable man. Admirable was his father. Still and noble was his bearing. Pure was his life. Wise were his words. Fine and noble thoughts dwelled in his brow. But even he... The man who knew so much, did he live in bliss? Was he at peace? Was he not also a seeker, a thirster? Did he not always and always again have to drink a thirster from the holy sources, from the sacrifices, from the books, from the dialogues of the Brahmins? Why must he, the irreproachable man, wash away sin every day, strive for purification every day, every day anew? Was Atman not in him? Did not the primal source flow in his own heart? One had to find it, the primal source in one's own self. One had to make it one's own. Everything else was seeking, was detour, was confusion. Those were Siddhartha's thoughts. That was his thirst. That was his suffering. Often he murmured these words, 
from a Chandogoya, Upanishad. Truly, the name of Brahma is Satya. Verily, he who knows this enters the celestial world every day. It often seemed close, the celestial world, but he never fully reached it, never slaked his ultimate thirst. And among all the wise and wisest whom he knew, and whose instruction he partook, none of them had reached it, the celestial world. None had fully slaked it, the eternal thirst. Govinda, Siddhartha spoke to his friend. Govinda, dear friend, come with me to the banyan tree. Let us meditate. They went to the banyan tree. They sat down. Here, Siddhartha, twenty paces further, Govinda, sitting down, ready to speak the Om. Siddhartha, murmuring, repeated the verses. Om is bow, the arrow is soul. Brahma is the arrow's goal. It must be struck unswervingly. When the usual span of meditation was ended, Govinda rose to his feet. Evening had come. It was time for the ablutions of the evening hour. He called Siddhartha's name. Siddhartha did not respond. Siddhartha sat, absorbed, his eyes rigidly fixed on a very far goal, the tip of his tongue protruding slightly between his teeth. He seemed not to be breathing. Thus he sat, wrapped in meditation, thinking Om, his soul sent out as an arrow to Brahma. Once, Samanas had passed through Siddhartha's town, wandering ascetics, three gaunt, spent men, not old, not young, with dusty and bloody shoulders, well nigh naked, singed by the sun, circled by solitude, foe and foreign to the world, strangers and haggard jackals in the realm of men, from them a hot scent of silent passion came wafting, a scent of devastating service, of pitiless unselfing. In the evening, after the hour of contemplation, Siddhartha said to Govinda, Tomorrow morning, my friend, Siddhartha will join the Samanas. He will become a Samana. Govinda blanched upon hearing these words, and in his friend's immobile face he read the resolve, as undivertible as the arrow shot from the bow. Instantly, and at first glance, Govinda realized, now it is beginning. Now Siddhartha is following his path. Now his destiny is starting to sprout, and mine with his. And he turned as pale as a dried banana peel. Oh, Siddhartha, he cried, will your father allow this? Siddhartha looked at him as if awakening from sleep. Swift as an arrow, he read Govinda's soul, read the fear, read the devotion. Oh, Govinda, he murmured, let us not waste words. Tomorrow at daybreak, I will begin the life of the Samanas. Do not speak about it any more. Siddhartha entered the room where his father was sitting on a mat of bast. The son stepped behind the father and stood there until his father sensed that someone was standing behind him. The Brahmin spoke. Is that you, Siddhartha? Then say what you have come to say. Siddhartha spoke. With your permission, my father, I have come to say that I long to leave your house tomorrow and join the ascetics. My longing is to become a Samana. May my father have nothing against it. The Brahmin was silent, and silent so long that the stars were wandering across the small window, changing their patterns. By the time the silence in the room ended, mute and motionless, the sun stood with crossed arms, mute and motionless, the father sat on the mat, and the stars drifted across the sky. Then the father said, 
It is not fitting for a Brahmin to speak angry and violent words, but indignation moves my heart. I do not wish to hear that request a second time from your lips. Slowly, the Brahmin rose. Siddhartha stood mute, with crossed arms. What are you waiting for? asked the father. Siddhartha said, You know what? Indignant, the father left the room. Indignant, he sought his bed and lay down. An hour later, since no sleep came to his eyes, the Brahmin got up, paced to and fro, stepped out of the house. He peered through the small window into the room. There he saw Siddhartha standing with crossed arms, unmoved. His light-colored robe shimmered pale. With distress in his heart, the father returned to his bed. An hour later, since no sleep came to his eyes, the Brahmin got up again, paced to and fro, stepped out of the house, saw the risen moon. He peered through the window. Into the room, there stood Siddhartha, unmoved with crossed arms, the moonlight mirrored by his bare shins. With anxiety in his heart, the father went back to his bed. And he came again an hour later, and came again two hours later, peered through the small window, saw Siddhartha standing in the moonlight, in the starlight, in the darkness, and came again from hour to hour, silent, peered into the room, saw the unmoved stander, filled his heart with anger, filled his heart with apprehension, filled his heart with fear, filled it with sorrow. And in the final hour of night, before the day began, he returned, stepped into the room, and saw the youth standing there. And he looked big and foreign. Siddhartha, he said, what are you waiting for? You know what? Will you keep standing and waiting until the day becomes noon, becomes evening? I will stand and wait. You will grow tired, Siddhartha. I will grow tired. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I will not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I will die. And you would rather die than obey your father. Siddhartha has always obeyed his father. Then you will give up your plan. Siddhartha will do what his father will say. The first gleam of day entered the room. The Brahmin saw that Siddhartha's knees were quivering slightly. He saw no quivering in his face. Siddhartha's eyes gazed far away. Now the father realized that Siddhartha was no longer with him and in his homeland, that he had already left him. The father touched Siddhartha's shoulder. You will, he said, go into the forest and become a samana. If you find bliss in the forest, then come and teach me bliss. If you find disillusion, then come back and let us jointly sacrifice to the gods again. But for me, it is time to go to the river and perform the first ablution. He removed his hand from his son's shoulder and went out. Siddhartha reeled when he tried to walk. He subdued his limbs, bowed to his father, and went to his mother to do as his father had said. When in the first light of day, Walking slowly on numb legs, he left the still silent town. A shadow, crouching by the last hut, stood up and joined the pilgrim. It was Govinda. You have come, said Siddhartha, and smiled. I have come, said Govinda. Govinda.